I'm an old shop steward. And whenever I went into a battle, I made certain we had a bloody door ready to be opened. <laughs> Otherwise, if you closed that door behind you, you never sometimes got out of a situation. You had to have a door ready that could be opened. I believe we have to have a door ready in this situation that can be opened. A door that can give him some chance of saving some of his face in order that we can solve the problem by negotiation and not by war. Because if it's by war, who knows where we're going to end up in the end. I don't know. No one knows. Maybe it would be over quickly. Maybe it would be like the Galtieri situation. They would be destroyed and so on. No, I'm not giving way, comrade. I'm not giving way. This may well be my last speech in this House of Commons. I don't know. What I'm saying is this. That as far as I'm concerned, we have to talk in terms of trying to find a solution without going to war. With regard to, um, to our Commissioner Leon Britton, he is of course a member of the Commission, he is a loyal member of the Commission. Yes, the Commission does want to increase its powers. Yes, it is a non-elected body and I do not want the Commission to increase its powers against this House. So of course we are differing. Of course the Chairman or the President of the Commission, Mr. Delors, said at press conference the other day that he wanted the European Parliament to be the democratic body of the community. He wanted the Commission to be the Executive and he wanted the Council of Ministers to be the Senate. No! 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 Being elected in 1983 uh, in somewhat a surprised form, with a less than generous majority of 74 votes, the first day at Westminster was an occasion which I'm sure all members of this House will agree you simply never forget. With a majority that small, who is to say what quite tipped the balance? But I have to admit that the day before the election, uh, there was a showing on television of my father's film, The Blue Lamp, which was the old Archie-type, Bobby-on-the-beat type movie. Yeah, yeah. Now, perhaps it helped. Who can tell? But when I went in through the St. Stephen's entrance on the day to take the oath, as the first time as the member for Richmond and Barnes, the policeman on the door said, uh, uh, Mr. Ainley, I'm very sorry that your late father isn't around to see you come into this house, sir. I think he'd have been very proud. I said, well, thank you, Sergeant. That's very kind. He said, mind you, sir, I think the shock might have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that absolutely true. <laughs> I'm sure honourable and right honourable members have noted those smiles which play on the face of the constabulary in this Palace of Westminster. I mean, could it be the confidence of a job well done or more likely the fact that whatever the result of the next election, they'll be back. <laughs> it, was on one of the, it was on that day, too, that I learnt one of the most important lessons about the House of Commons. I had sat in the chamber to take the oath and watched from a, a modest spot near the back of the government side uh, as the famous and the lesser-known file passed. Uh, it was just like viewing a, a walking waxworks, or as one, constituent, <laughs> as one constituent said, it's just like Madame Tussauds, except the exhibits look slightly less lifelike. <laughs> and as I was... <laughs> and as I was sitting over there on the uh, bench, the fourth row back, I was very conscious that somebody had sat next to me, and I turned around to see who it was, and... I saw him and said, startled, uh, how do you do? I didn't realise that you were on our side. <laughs> the honourable and reverend neighbour said to me in his unmistakable terms, never confuse sitting on your side with being on your side. <laughs> The second thing that happened was, I fear, even more disturbing. Reporting to this house, my right honourable friend almost casually remarked that she didn't think many people would want to use the hard AQ anyway, even as a common currency, let alone as a single one. It was remarkable, indeed it was tragic, to hear my right honourable friend dismissing, with such personalised incredulity, the very idea that the hard AQ proposal 
might find growing favour among the peoples of Europe. Just as it was extraordinary to hear her assert that the whole idea of EMU might be open for consideration only by future generations. Mr Speaker, those future generations are with us today. How on earth are the Chancellor and the Governor of the Bank of England commending the hard AQ as they strive to do to be taken as serious participants in the debate against that kind of background noise? Mr Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker I believe that both the Chancellor and the Governor are cricketing enthusiasts. So I hope there's no monopoly of cricketing metaphors. It's rather like sending your opening batsman to the crease, only for them to find, the moment the first balls are bowled, that their bats have been broken before the game by the team captain. Order. The point, the point, Mr. Speaker was perhaps more sharply put by a British businessman trading in Brussels and elsewhere who wrote to me last week. People throughout Europe, he said, see our Prime Minister's finger wagging and hear her passionate no, 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 much more clearly than the content of the carefully worded formal texts. It is too easy, he went on, for them to believe that we all share her attitudes. For why else, he asked, has she been our Prime Minister for so long? This is, my correspondent concluded, a desperately serious situation for our country. And sadly, Mr Speaker, I have to agree. The tragedy is, and it is for me personally, for my party, for our whole people, and for my right honourable friend herself, a very real tragedy, that the Prime Minister's perceived attitude towards Europe is running increasingly serious risks for the future of our nation. It risks minimising our influence and maximising our chances of being once again shut out. We've paid heavily in the past for late starts and squandered opportunities in Europe. We dare not let that happen again. If we detach ourselves completely, as a party or as a nation, from the middle ground of Europe, the effects will be incalculable and very hard ever to correct. Mr Speaker, in my letter of resignation, which I tendered with the utmost sadness and dismay, I said that Cabinet Government is all about trying to persuade one another from within. That was my commitment to Government by persuasion, persuading colleagues and the nation. I've tried to do that as Foreign Secretary and since. But I realise now that the task has become futile of trying to stretch the meaning of words beyond what is credible of trying to pretend there was a common policy when every step forward risked being subverted by some casual comment or impulsive answer. The conflict of loyalty, of loyalty to my right honourable friend the Prime Minister, and after more than two decades together, that instinct of loyalty is still very real, and of loyalty to what I perceive to be the true interest of this nation, that conflict of loyalty has become all too great. I no longer believe it possible to resolve that conflict from within this government. That is why I have resigned. In doing so, I have done what I believe to be right for my party and my country. The time has come for others to consider their own response to the tragic conflict of loyalties with which I have myself wrestled for perhaps too long. We want the community to move forward as 12. And from my talks in Paris with other European leaders over these past few days, I'm convinced that that is their aim too. Europe is strongest when it grows through willing cooperation and practical measures, not compulsion, nor bureaucratic dreams. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm most grateful to the Prime Minister. Will she tell us whether she intends to continue her own personal fight against a single currency and an independent central bank when she leaves office? No, she's going to be the governor. On the present structure...
Prime Minister. What a good idea. <laughs> Of it. But if I were, there'd be no European Central Bank accountable to no one, least of all to national parliaments. Yeah, yeah. Because the point of that kind of European Central Bank is no democracy taking powers away from every single parliament and being able to have a single currency and a monetary policy and an interest rate which takes all political power away from us. As my right honourable friend said in his first speech, after the proposal of a single currency, a single currency is about the politics of Europe. It is about a federal Europe by the back door. So I'll consider the honourable gentleman's proposal. Now, where were we? I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. In the early hours of this morning, after consulting with us and with other coalition partners, President Bush announced our decision to suspend offensive military operations in the Gulf with effect from 5 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time this morning. We took that decision as soon as it became clear that Kuwait had been liberated and that Iraq's army had been comprehensively defeated. We took the view immediately that there could be no question of continuing to attack an army which had been defeated notwithstanding the lack of a surrender by their commanders. By that time, 42 Iraqi divisions had been effectively destroyed. At the latest count, coalition forces have captured, destroyed or disabled over 3,700 Iraqi tanks out of 4,200 in the theatre. Over 2,100 artillery pieces out of 3,100 in theatre and over 1,800 armoured vehicles out of 2,800 in theatre. There are at present 60,000 Iraqi prisoners documented so far, with many thousands more yet to be recorded. In accordance with these criteria, we have reached our conclusions about the future of the community charge. In spite of the comprehensive system of income-related rebates and the reduction scheme we devised, the public have not been persuaded that the charge is fair. We, we, have, we have... Order! Order! We have therefore decided that from the earliest possible moment the community charge will be replaced by a new system of local taxation. After a careful reappraisal of the options, we have decided in principle to bring forward a new local tax under which there will be a single bill for each household comprising two essential elements the number of adults living there and the value of the property. There are a number of ways of assessing values on a capital or a rental basis which require careful evaluation and extensive discussion and consultation. On the shape of local government, uh, the principle of single-tier authorities um, should be a firm government decision with consultation being concerned with the way in which can this, this can be most sensibly and best be implemented. And as for consultation on the nature of the new local tax, that is nothing less than an infallible recipe for maximising dissent. Um, I, note, I note that the Right, right Honourable Friends of the Chancellor very wisely did not do any consultation about his switch from uh, the community charge to 17.5% VAT, and I congratulate him on how well the secret was kept. Uh, but he, of course, he wouldn't have dreamed of doing any consultation. I, during my six years as uh, Chancellor, introduced a far-reaching programme of tax reform. And I have to tell this House, I have to tell this House, if I had put it out for consultation, not a single reform would have been possible to enact. Not one of them. 
Um, I have no doubt whatever that that is, that that is so. I think it was Pierre Mendes France who said that to govern was to choose. I agree with that. And to appear to be unable to choose is to appear to be unable to govern. Why does he keep on insisting that government economic policies are working when nearly three million of our fellow citizens aren't? Does he not see any connection between the loss of a thousand manufacturing jobs each day for the first 90 working days of this year and high interest rates? And will he acknowledge that electors were looking forward to a June election yeah. because it's only during election periods that this government manages to get interest rates That's down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Rising unemployment and the recession have been the price that we've had to pay in order to get inflation down. But that, that, but that, that is a price well worth paying. May I remind the Honourable Gentleman that inflation under the last Labour government was never lower than 7.4%. We shall have an average rate of inflation this year for the whole of this year lower than that. All of us like the Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, and it's difficult to be rude about him. I've not yet attempted. <laughs> But I must confess, he reminds me of one of the most notable characters in current folklore, Charlie Brown in <laughs> Peanuts. Uh, you may remember, Mr. Speaker, because I'm sure you're an avid follower of Peanuts, that Peanuts was once approached by Lucy, who was a bossy little girl <laughs> <laughs> the parallel escapes me <laughs> and she asked Charlie to join her on an ocean cruise so they got on the boat and she took Charlie up to the sun deck and said to Charlie now Charlie she said there you'll see a stack of deck chairs and you have to put your deck chair up and Charlie if you want to look backwards you put it facing of the stern of the boat which he obviously preferred to do herself uh, if you want to look forward into the future you place it facing the prow of the boat now Charlie she said on this great liner of life which way do you want your deck chair facing? And Charlie replied, so much like the Prime Minister, I don't seem able to get my deck chair unfolded. <laughs> we learned some days ago that bags containing diplomatic mail, Canadian diplomatic mail, had been discovered by staff at Wandsworth Prison. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> diplomatic bags, Mr. Speaker, diplomatic bags are routinely sent to Wandsworth Prison for laundry. <laughs> On this occasion... Mr. Speaker, I must get the answer out. <laughs> On this occasion, the Canadian bags in question had been inadvertently included in such a consignment sent to Wandsworth. <laughs> Steps were immediately taken to recover the diplomatic mail and to investigate the incident. The Honourable Gentleman says that the Government sent this material to be laundered. We... <laughs> Order, order. I, I think we're going to sit down. 
Well, I can't help you next time. Is it going... Is it going to send other material that it wants to launder to Wandsworth Prison? Or does it... Is the government now going to come clean about this episode? Mr. Speaker, may I take may I may I take the right honourable gentleman's question seriously? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, clearly this is a matter uh, for the Foreign Office to. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I order. I'm beginning to wonder whether I should have granted this free and private notice question. The Labour Party is a collection of sociologists and textbook entrepreneurs who will apply the economic economics of the common room to matters which are best dealt with by industry and commerce alone. The opposition trade and industry front bench want to run industry, but not one of them has ever run anything, except a, perhaps a commune. Their team, their team can, their te well, they, they, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's a fact. Their team, their front bench team, these people want to run our economy. I'll tell you what they did before they came into this place. Right? Their team consists of two university lecturers, one trade union official, a charity worker, a TV producer, a social worker, and a psychiatrist. I mean, that's who's going to run the country, that him. lot. And they need him. They need him, they need the psychiatrist. That's the bloody good bloke there. Their strategy for industry, well, you've got to laugh, and even they're laughing at it. It's a joke, isn't it? All these amendments complicate what I believe is already an absurdly complicated piece of legislation. I remember when I was a child and you had too much rice pudding and your brother had less and you loathed it. You'd say, that's not fair. And Nanny said, life isn't fair, laddie. And if we just... And if, if we just charge everybody, as we do for a pint of beer, a loaf of bread, a television license, or anything else, whether they're the Duke of Plaza Torah or the member for nowhere, the same price, that would be fair. And I wish we would do that, and I'm sorry that this legislation is doing the opposite. Now I understand, because I hear it wherever I go. The Right Honourable Member has become a star of attraction in the City of London. Lunch after lunch, dinner after dinner, the assurances flow, the prawns are consumed, soft shells, soft words, soft lights, not a discordant crumb flaws onto the thick pile. All will be well, is the message he conveys. The Shadow Cabinet? Don't you worry is the message. I've stitched them up. <laughs> the words are no sooner uttered than up pops the Honourable Member for Oldham West, the Shadow Secretary of State for Social Security. If you took a poll on Labour's public expenditure commitments in the city, you would find it almost 100% against. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Think of the tragedy. All those torn cocktails for nothing. <laughs> Never have so many crustaceans died in vain. <laughs> the, 
With all the authority I command as Environment Secretary, let me say to the Right Honourable Gentleman from Monkland East, save the prawns. <laughs> And the Leaves of the Committee are put together at clauses 1 to 126. Question is at clauses 1 to 126 done part of the bill. Uh, the Minister has been said aye, the country now think the aye, have it, the aye, have it. Question is at schedules 1 to 22 be the schedules to the bill. Many of them say aye, the country don't think the aye, have it, the aye, have it. Question is I do report the bill without amendment to the House. Many of them say aye, the no, I think the aye, have it, the aye, have it, or order. <laughs> Now, Sir Edward, I know that on occasions such as this, the House can be somewhat sentimental. And there's nothing wrong with sentiment in some circumstances. But, you know, when it comes down to basics, the House is essentially hard-headed. So I don't need to urge this House today to make its decision only on the grounds of the qualities which have been revealed by my conduct in the chair and by my membership of this house. I say to you, elect me for what I am and not for what I was born. That is crucial. Faced with this uh, task uh, today, I took myself to the smoking room to seek the advice of a distinguished and senior member of this party. Don't worry, he said. You'll be fine. This motion is nearly always proposed by some genial old codger on the way out. <laughs> and seconded by an oily young man on the make. <laughs> So, so, Madam Speaker, I decided to take some further advice and I went to another distinguished member, an ex-minister indeed. I said, what shall I do? He said, you'll be fine. You come from a political family. You follow in immensely distinguished parental footsteps. So I said, thank you very much for your advice, Father. <laughs> Now, of course, aside from my honourable friend, the principal voice attacking the Germans has been Mrs Thatcher. She's attacked the Germans and everything they stand by, and she seems to me to be conducting herself like one of those persons one sometimes encounters on a bus. Someone who sits there with the seats around left strategically empty, and who, as the journey proceeds, has violent and incoherent imprecations at her fellow passengers. I'm sure we've all experienced such people. The Prime Minister, for his part, is like one of the other passengers, sitting there, stiff and embarrassed, desperately trying to pretend that this eccentric person making such a commotion is not really there at all, <laughs> and is certainly nothing whatever to do with him. Perhaps next week we will have announced a dramatic reshuffle of the office furniture. The week after that, sweeping new recommendations on the colour of the curtains. But when there are no new measures on research, manufacturing, technology and exports, his is absolute power over a department that is unfortunately becoming absolutely powerless. So the Minister, the President, who spent years in exile working out his plans, who promised so much, who stormed the country with his new ideas for an industrial strategy, the darling of the Conservative associations, the hero of a thousand Conservative party lunches, the interventionist tiger of the rubber chicken circuit, has been brought low, reduced to trophy status, the tiger once the king of the jungle, now just the fireside rug. <laughs> decorative. <laughs> decorative. <laughs> decorative and ostentatious, certainly. But they're essentially to be walked all over. We have a government whose economic policy is in tatters, whose credibility is blown, 
whose incompetence has been exposed. And it will no longer do to blame others. And it will no longer do to say that their policies will, given time, come right. They have been in power for the longest continuous period in post-war Britain. And, 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 and as they assent to that proposition, they must accept that they are the only architect, the sole constructors of our present dismal situation. In the course of a few weeks, the one policy with which the Prime Minister was uniquely and personally associated, the contribution to policies of which he appears to have been most proud, has been blown apart, and with it has gone forever any claim by the Prime Minister or the party he leads to economic competence. He is the devalued Prime Minister of a devalued government. <laughs> And Madam Speaker, I want to make clear to uh, my colleagues and members of this House that uh, uh, for me, while of course uh, I have my uh, regrets about this matter, this is not uh, actually uh, a sad moment for me. Uh, after what uh, my family and I have been through for these last two months, it's almost with a sense of relief that I come to make this statement, since there were times during that period when one wonders whether one was living in Ceausescu's Romania rather than John Major's Britain. As bug telephone calls and, uh, and other things uh, uh, came out. But I want to make, I want to make clear to uh, the House that I resigned for what I hope the House will agree with the, was the best of reasons. I could not expect my colleagues, uh, either in the Government or in Parliament, to put up uh, with more and more ceaseless flow of stories about me in the tabloid press. And having grown heartily sick of my private life myself, I could hardly expect others to take uh, a more uh, charitable view. And then I hear com complaints from my honourable friend over here, who I heard boasting the other day on television that he didn't understand two words of French. I don't know what there's to boast about. <laughs> Could my peut-être mon ami peut dire à cette maison what is meant by in English in two words by aqui communautaire? Just two words in English so that we understand. No. <laughs> Two and a half years ago, I did play some part in helping the Prime Minister into the position which he occupies today. I have always believed, and still believe, that in supporting him then, I made the right choice. And I now wish to say one thing to him. It goes to the heart of the way this government conducts itself. There is something wrong with the way we make our decisions. The government listens too much to the posters and the party managers. The trouble is that they are not even very good at politics, and they are entering too much into policy decisions. As a result, there is too much short-termism, too much reacting to events, not enough shaping of events. We give the impression of being in office, but not in power. I turn finally to what the House may view as the most serious aspect of this whole affair, namely that quite improper pressure has apparently been exercised by the SFO upon the trial judge, Mr Justice Tucker. Oh, order! 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 I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I am now, I am now, order! I am now requiring, I'm now requiring the Honourable Gentleman to resume his seat. He must resume his seat. Order, 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 let me hear. This has been reported in the newspapers. It has Sorry? been reported in the newspapers. Order, it has nothing whatsoever to do with publicity or newspapers. I am, I am listening, order, I am listening to a personal statement from the Honourable Gentleman, what, not what appears in the newspapers. Your, your personal statement I want to hear. Madam Speaker. 
It is this sequence of events, above all, which demands an independent inquiry. And if one cannot come to the House and tell them what is wrong with the system, if one cannot speak in this place, not about innocence or guilt, not about trial, not about subjudice, but what has gone wrong with the system, then, Madam Speaker, then, Madam Speaker, it, it is after the trial that the honourable gentleman must give this information. That is the point. Political differences are not the be-all and end-all of relationships for members of this House. When I think of John Smith, I think of an opponent, not an enemy. And when I remember him, I shall do so with respect and with affection. And when I think of his premature death, I shall think of the waste that it has brought to our public life. The waste of a remarkable political talent. The waste of a high and an honourable ambition to lead our country. The waste of a man in public life who in all his actions retained a human touch. And in some ways, Madam Speaker, above all, a waste of the tranquility and happiness that his past endeavours would have so richly deserved in the years to come. He said to me recently, why would anyone bother to go into politics unless it's to speak up for people who can't speak up for themselves? That feeling for others, along with his hatred of injustice, were the forces that drove him the service to which he gave his life. Last night, Madam Speaker, he spoke at a gala dinner in London. He was in high fettle and in high spirits. He spoke not from a text, but from notes. And when he sat down, I congratulated him, especially on his final sentence. Spoken as it was, off the cuff and from the heart. They were almost the last words I heard him say. He looked at the assembled gathering and he said, and I quote, the opportunity to serve our country, that is all we ask. Let it stand as his epitaph.